Well, blessings, everybody, and welcome. I'm Dale, and I thank you so much for joining with me today on Answers. Uh, Answers is a program where we do a very, very simple thing. We simply look at the Word of the Most High God. We look in the Bible, and we say, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to show us? What are you uh, revealing to us? And we do it often from the perspective of the questions that we have day in and day out. There's things that pop in our minds. There's things that happen into us in life. And we wonder, God, what is the, what's the deal about this? And we go to the Word, and He reveals things to us. And that's the reason we call the program Answers. It's because we realize that it's the Word of the Most High that gives us insight, <clears throat> gives us revelation, gives us illumination, gives us enlightenment, gives us understanding day in and day out. Uh, you know, in recent days, we've been looking at uh, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, over the time that we've actually been doing this program, we've had look, have looked at multitudes of subject matter, quite often related to what is occurring <clears throat> in the news of the day. And so in the last few, what, two, three, four times that we've been together, we've been talking about what's been going on in the Middle East and what's happening there. And at the time of our gathering together right now, things are still happening, okay? I've got news for you. Things will always be happening until the Lord returns and it's all said and done. And the new heaven and the new earth are forever and forever. Up until that time, you're going to have tremendous turmoil in the Middle East. Now, I know what people say. They say, well, there, I think we can have peace. I think we can have that. I think we'll have lulls. I think we'll have time where it looks like peace. I know without any doubt, because the Word says this, that there will be a time when there will be a covenant, either signed or confirmed, a previous covenant that's been signed, that there will be a covenant that will be enacted where all the world is going to be thinking there's going to be peace right there. But no sooner than that covenant is signed and everybody thinks it's going to be real peaceful, things are going to start stirring again. Someone's going to go out conquering and to conquer. There's going to be wars that will start occurring. And then there's going to be tremendous death. And then there's going to be famine. And three and a half years after the time of that covenant is signed, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will walk in, will tell the Jews to quit offering their sacrifice, quit doing all the things that they're doing there, and will sit there and begin to persecute Israel and her offspring, the offspring being the church. How do I know it's the church? Because the offspring is described in Revelation 12 as being those who adhere to the commandments of God and who believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's a believer. So we've been looking at these things, been examining and saying, well, Lord, what does this have to do? Well, we know that he tells us in Matthew 24 there will be wars and rumors of wars. But he says these are not even beginning the birth pangs yet. Okay, Things like this will happen. Prior to what's happened in the latest upheaval with Israel and Hamas and all that, we were looking in the book of Jude and spent really several episodes in the book of Jude looking at the type of people that rise up from within. Okay, people that rise up from within the church. And to be forewarned of that because you're going to have people that will come forth that will do all sorts of things. And they'll do it with a big smile. But they are evil. And Jude gives us tremendous detail about it. So we went through Jude. We've been speaking some about the Middle East. I told you that we would go to the uh, second chapter of Second Peter to pick up the Jude thing because there's a lot of parallels right there. But I started looking at that and reflected on that. And I thought, well, let's do this. What we're going to do, we're going to go back and look at the book of First Peter. Okay? Peter wrote two letters that we have in Scripture, First Peter and Second Peter. And the reason I want to look at the overall thing is that sometimes... It's really easy to sit there and look at the, at the, the truth and the hard word. You know, you look at Jude. Remember what Jude said? I really wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I felt the necessity to write to you, to encourage you and exhort you to contend for the faith. Remember that? That was the reason he wrote. He really, really wanted to write to them to tell them about their common salvation, to rejoice in that and just talk to them about what had happened with them and what the Lord was doing. And so I thought if we go back to 1 Peter and look at the first part of 1 Peter and perhaps just work our way all the way through that, then we will be able to have exactly that happen to us. Because what you see so often, even when the Spirit is moving upon these uh, people who are writing, whether it be uh, John or Paul or Peter, that you will see that they are so encouraging. They really tell us who we are in the Most High God. They give us profound truths. Even though they may be going over here to bring a corrective word and a warning, they bring us tremendous and profound things, okay? So let's do that. Let's go to the book of 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter is toward the end of the Bible, okay? Toward the end of the New Testament. Very short book. First and Second Peter both are. 
Um, but I want you, I want you just to uh, sort of glean some things and understand how God does some things here. Now, I, I love Peter uh, because Peter's like us. Okay, Peter's the one that well, you'll see it in one of his writings here. He'll say uh, somewhere it is written. In other words, he's saying something that's written from the Scripture, from the Old Testament, in his perspective. Okay, from the Old Testament, and he will quote it. He'll say somewhere this is written. He didn't exactly remember where it was. He didn't know what book it was in or anything. He just says somewhere it's written. Is that not like us? So often we feel like we have to know exactly where it is, the address, and all this, or we're really not truly saved. Nothing could be further from the truth. Peter also comes along and he talks about some of Paul's writings. And he says, you know, it's like our brother Paul says. And he says, he writes some things that are hard to understand. And I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in the fact that Peter had a hard time sometimes understanding what Paul was writing about. Okay? And so the, we, when we see Peter, we know that he is just your basic down-to-earth guy. He was a businessman, okay? He owned a fishing company. He owned more than, he was more than just a fisherman because he had boats, okay? So he owned some things. But he wasn't like Paul. Paul had been raised and trained. Paul would have been the one today that had two or three or four PhDs. Paul knew where it was, okay? So he could quote things straight like this and knew where to go. He was brilliant from that perspective and been trained in that way. Peter was trained in another way. And it's really sort of interesting because when it's all said and done, the one that is sent to the Gentiles is Paul. Though he did bring the word to the Jews and he had a lot to do with the Jews, but he was sent to the Gentiles. You would think the one that had the great Jewish background with all the Jewish training and the PhDs in Judaism would have been sent to the Jews. No, he was sent to the Gentiles. And then the one that was a Jew, but he was a businessman, a fisherman, with no religious theological training, was sent to the Jewish people. And you say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, that's the reason we're not God. God does things the way that he desires to. Okay? So let's look at what he says right here. And we'll read the first couple of verses right here and take a break and come back and look at some more. Okay? So this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he acknowledges right at the very beginning that it's him writing that. When you see it that way, that means, hey, this is Peter. And he says, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word apostle just simply means messenger. It's one sent forth with a message. Okay? And you say, well, uh, there, there's the apostles. You're right. And there's apostle. There's apostles and apostles. There are the 12 apostles, and they're special. There's a, a special thing about the 12. There really are. You see it over in Revelation. There's some things that lead us to that. But then you see several other people in the New Testament that are described as being apostles. So there's more than just the 12. You have the 12, but then you have others. Uh, there may be as many as 19 that are mentioned in the New Testament. It simply means someone who is sent. And you say, well, I see people today that have the title apostle. Yeah, yeah. You, you see that kind of stuff all the time. You see somebody that's the apostle, bishop, overseer, of the first church of what's happening now. You know, they have long titles and long names. <laughs> That's fine, but you know, I often question that kind of thing. I like what you see in Scripture. You see Paul being called what? Paul, Peter, Peter, John, Jesus. You know, one name, simple, relating to one another. So he's saying, hey, this is Peter. I'm the one that's the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been sent by him. And then he tells us who he's writing to. He says, to those. So that he's talking about who he's writing to. And if you were to sit down... And what you learn in this first chapter about those that he wrote to, and just write down what you learn. I've got it written in my Bible right here. I know you can't see it, but it's probably 20 things that we learn about these individuals that he's writing to. First thing we're going to learn is this. He says, to those who reside as aliens. So they're aliens. They're not aliens in the sense that Nick is thinking over here behind the board right now. Not outer space aliens, okay? They're aliens from the perspective that wherever they are at this very moment... They're not there from there originally. Okay, something had happened. And he actually tells us in the next couple of words what happened. They had been scattered. To those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout. So he's writing to a group of believers. Okay? Most of them, though not all of them, but most of them would have been Jewish in background. But he's writing to them and he says, I'm writing to you because I realize that you're aliens where you are right now. I realize that you have been scattered. And then he describes some of the places where they were, that you've been scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. So he's telling where they'd been scattered. They'd been scattered up north, okay, into what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor. He says, I'm writing to you. So that means that this right here would have been a circular kind of letter. He wrote the letter, and it would have been sent to church, to church, to church, and they all would have read it, you know, to each portion of the body of Christ. Then he says this, who are chosen? 
you see how much you learn right here if you just sort of take it a, a word at a time instead of just sort of blowing through an introduction? If you just sit there and say, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me? You find out some things right here. Peter was writing. It's Peter, he's an apostle. He's a messenger. He's sent by the Most High God. And he's writing to a group of people. And he's a group of people. And he's acknowledging from the very beginning that you're aliens, that you've been scattered. In other words, I know what has happened to you. And I know where you're scattered too, but let me tell you something. At the end of this verse, which is really the middle of a sentence, okay? So in the original Greek and even the English right now, the sentence is not broken. He says, who are chosen. He tells them that they are chosen. They're chosen by the Most High God. Sometimes we forget that. When we look at all these things that we've been looking at, when we look at what's going on in the Middle East, when you look at what's happening with the body of Christ and what Jude had warned us about, about men, certain men that have crept in unnoticed who will rise up and do horrific things. When you see the things that Jesus spoke about with the wheat and the tear, that is the wheat is growing, you're going to have the tares. In other words, the false that looks like the real. You're going to have that. Sometimes you sit there and go, well, you know, that sort of sounds down and depressing. We forget and need to be reminded that we who are true believers are chosen. And then he goes into tremendous detail in the second verse. We're in the second verse here. Listen to what he says about the chosen. You're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Chosen according to the foreknowledge? God chose each and every believer before he spoke anything into existence. Now, boy, that opens up all sorts of things because there's words that you see all through Scripture that people always go, oh, I don't know about that, I don't know about that. You'll see the word chosen. You'll see the word elect. You'll see the word predestination. You'll see the word foreknowledge. I remember in college, I used to have people come to me all the time, do you believe in predestination? That was the big thing back in the 70s. Do you believe in predestination? I said, well, the Scripture talks about it. The Scripture says it right there. Then they'd want to argue with you. Well, no, it's not an argument thing. Let's just see what the Word of God says. Now, the Word of God says something about it over here, and it says something about it over here, and we need the full counsel of the Word of God to get a complete understanding that the Lord has revealed to us. But it's nothing to argue about. It's something that we sit there and discuss and that we rejoice in. What he's saying, you've been chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father. According to that, the Lord knew everything about creation before he spoke any of it into existence. And you start thinking on that and meditating on that for a while, it's just amazing. You really do go to where Isaiah did. Isaiah said, Lord, that kind of thinking is way above my, my ability, high above what I can comprehend, high above what I understand. But I rejoice in it and I give thanks for it. So he says, you're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. And still not the end of the sentence, but let me just point out a couple things. We'll take a break. You see all three elements, all three persons. You see God in his fullness right here. You see the Father. You see the Spirit. You see the Son. By the foreknowledge of God, you were chosen. And he says, for what purpose? For the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The Spirit sanctifies us. That's the reason that we are saved, justified, particularly when we, when we believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon him and repent and confess. Then we continue to be sanctified growing in holiness. The Spirit is the one who does that. He sanctifies us. He refines us. He transforms us and conforms us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. The whole point of salvation, the whole point of the choosing right here, the way you are chose is because the foreknowledge of God and he called and is done through the Lord Jesus Christ that we are sprinkled with his blood, that we continue to be sanctified by his Spirit and it's all planned by God. Then the last part of this first sentence is this. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. In the fullest measure. Just an introduction, a two-verse introduction, and it gives such hope because he's going to talk to me just a moment about the fact that they're going through some hard times, some difficult times, and how they're acting and what they're doing and how they're reacting to it. I'll tell you what, I better take a break here real quick so y'all stay with me. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay.
Yes, I will say it again for you, Nick. I have more women than I need. We were talking off camera, and he said, he said I'll bring that up. We were talking about uh, uh, different things because uh, I, somebody asked me this one time. You see in the scripture where men uh, married multiple women. They said, well, why do they do that? You know, and we were discussing that. Somebody was so how many wives are enough? <laughs> Which is a funny question. Uh, one. <laughs> one. Okay, one. And then the Lord blessed us with uh, the only, did you know this, guys? With the only biblical family that you see in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you see somebody that had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So I had four daughters. I still have four daughters. So anyway, here we are. We're in 1 Peter 1, and we just saw that Peter just laid down just one of the, the most encouraging proclamations of who they were. He said, guys, I'm writing to you. I know that you're aliens where you are. In other words, I know you're not home. I know you'd rather be home. I know you've been scattered. I know where you've gone to. I know this. I know that you've been chosen. And I know you've been chosen by the foreknowledge of God and by the sanctifying power of the Spirit. And the reason he did this is to where you would believe and obey the Lord Jesus Christ and be sprinkled by his blood. And then he does this. He says, may grace and peace be upon you. We don't do that enough. We don't speak grace and peace <clears throat> upon one another. Part of the reason is we don't think that there's really any power behind that. We really don't. We know there's power in the tongue because James tells us that and we see it throughout Scripture. And we know there's power to tear down people. And we do that a lot, unfortunately. You know, attack somebody and whatever it may be, the negative thing we do with tongue. But why don't we speak grace? May the grace of the Lord be upon you. <coughs> why don't we speak blessings? Why don't we speak peace and thanks upon each other? I think we should. Now, let's look at verse 3 right here. Uh, tremendous, tremendous verse. Listen to this. Peter continues on. Blessed be the God and Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a lot of places in the scripture where there's one or two verses which describe the totality of the faith of the kingdom. This is one of them right here. He's saying this, I bless God. And I thank God because it is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done this. And it's because of his great mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not receiving what you really should have received, okay? God pouring something out, okay? His great mercy upon us to be born again. <clears throat> and by that is our living hope. When we look at these things, when we see what's happening, we see stuff uh, in the Middle East. We see stuff in our own world here in, in Western society. And trust me, folks, these things are going to get worse. You know what I've told us many times before? Fear not, it's going to be worse. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And when, nowadays, people where we live are beginning to find out why things are the way they are. And they're so, sort of dumbfounded. And the reason they're sort of dumbfounded is they're finding out that it's planned and it's been manipulated and it's being done intentionally and it's being done by people that are in leadership that have been voted in who said one thing and yet do another. And they're sitting there and they're going, well, we've been lied to. To which I say a lot of times, well, no joke, I was telling you that eight years ago, but now you believe me, right? <clears throat> okay, that you're being lied to. If we put our faith and hope in what we see in the world, we're gonna be in trouble, forget it, okay? What he's saying right here is that our hope is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, from the dead. <clears throat> Just in case there's any confusion as to what resurrection is, our faith and our hope is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And you say, well, well why is that our faith and our hope? Because he's the firstborn of those that have been resurrected from the dead, which you see in 1 Corinthians 15. And he is now at the right hand of the Father. And at some point in time, uh, he is going to come and send forth his elect angels who will go and harvest and bring forth his body, the church, unto him. Our hope is in him because of the resurrection from the dead. That's the reason all other religions are hopeless. You've heard the adage many, many times. You go to uh, the grave sites of all the other major founders of religions, and guess what you find? You find their dead bodies. You find their skeletons and their bones, right? You find all that. Not the Lord Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead. So let me back up a little bit and read that again because it's still one sentence. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy had caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. We have an inheritance. 
as a believer because of the foreknowledge of God, because of His grace, because of His mercy, and because of the fact that He chose us. You got all that? Because of that, we have an inheritance. And it's an inheritance that is imperishable. Particularly, uh, Peter in his writings, you'll see where he'll do like three points every time. Jude did the same thing. Okay? You see that a lot. You see it with Paul a lot. They'll, they'll make a point, then there's three little subpoints to it. What he says right here, you have this inheritance, and it's imperishable. It's undefiled, and it will not fade away. There's an inheritance awaiting us who are awaiting the return of the Lord and our hopes in Him. And, and you think, well, what is this inheritance? We'll get a hint right here. Reserved in heaven for you. There's an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Now, when you look at Scripture, you see several things that sort of point that way. Yeah, Jesus said in, in uh, was it, uh, John 14, about I, I must go and build a mansion, many mansions to be prepared, okay, that type of thing. You have that? I think it's even more than that. The inheritance that we have is the Lord himself and who we are and what we will be in and through him at that time. Uh, we understand in a mirror dimly. He says, but it's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God. They're protected by the power of God. See, something's going on. I think we'll be able to see it in just a moment. We've got another verse or two. I think we've got time for another verse or two. Uh, they're undergoing trials and tribulations. He says this right here. You are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. See, the salvation that we have is also a salvation that continues when we are right now, but it's a salvation yet to come when the Lord comes at the last time. And he tells us this right here, that it's by faith that this salvation is ready for you, the faith that the Lord has released in you and that you believe and will obey. And because of that, you're protected by the power of God. Does that mean that no harm will ever come against us here on earth? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what he's talking about. The context is a little something different. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about resurrection. He's talking about that that's prepared for us and an inheritance that awaits us in heaven. He's not speaking just an earthly type of thing. And he's telling us this, that this inheritance is protected by the power of God. You're not going to lose it. If you're truly saved, if you're truly saved, you're not going to lose it like you lose your car keys or you misplace something, you do something like this. People will say, well, what if somebody walks in rebellion and they turn around and walk away from God? Oh, yeah, God will judge. He'll, he'll do that. But it's not the thing that you, quote, unquote, lose your salvation. Well, what if they do it and they blaspheme God and say all this kind of stuff? First John. John said this, if, if they turn away and walk away from us in that way, then they were never of us. They were never of us. A lot of people look very good and look very religious and look like they're living the right kind of life. And, and you know what? They're really not of the body of Christ. You actually see it in Matthew 25 with the parable of the virgins. You know, the ten virgins, they were awaiting the, the bridegroom and five were foolish and five were prepared. The five were prepared, had the oil. The five that were foolish didn't have the oil. And it's sort of interesting. People say, why didn't the five that have it share with the ones that, well, no, it's a parable. And when you see what the truth of it is, they couldn't have shared it. Here's why. Because at the end of the parable, the foolish ones are knocking at the door trying to get in. The Lord Jesus Christ says what? No, you can't come in. I never knew you. I never knew you. See, the five that knew him had the oil, the spirit. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't give it away because you must be saved and be known by the Lord to receive the Holy Spirit. The five that were awaiting the bridegroom, the five that were going about doing the stuff that they were, thought they were supposed to be doing religiously, never knew him. They didn't have the Spirit. They were probably the best members of the church, but they didn't have the Spirit. The scripture describes them as foolish. So look at this. Let's re read the first part of this last verse. and We'll pick it up next time, okay? And he says, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice. And you say, in what? Well, he's about to tell you. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That's the reason that Paul, uh, Paul Peter started writing the way that he did and encouraging them. Okay? Acknowledging, hey, I know that you are aliens. Acknowledging and saying, I know you've been scattered. Reminding them of who they were in the Lord, how they were chosen. He said, because I know that you have undergone various trials and you've been distressed. And he says, even though for a little while, if necessary if necessary we never think trials tribulations turmoil and trouble are necessary there's times when the Lord thinks that it's necessary he allows things to happen 
It may be difficult for us, but we need to understand this, that if it's passed through the hands of God, it is to where he will receive greater glory. Let me finish the sentence right here. We'll be done. This is verse 6 again. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. <laughs> yes, the next four verses are all one sentence right there. Do you see what he did? We'll look at this in much more detail next time. I just want you to see what he was doing. He was encouraging them, acknowledging there's trials and tribulations, but he says, you know what? Sometimes these things may be necessary as proof of your faith. Not proving the faith before God because God doesn't know. He said, I wonder if they're saved or not. <laughs> God knows, okay? But it's proof of the faith from our perspective to where we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt, to where we can know how we're supposed to be acting and reacting for the impact that it might have upon the kingdom here upon the earth at that time. The Lord allows those things to come. And he says, really, this type of thing is more precious than gold, this refining that takes place. Like I said, we'll look at this more later, <clears throat> next time we get together, I hope. In the meantime, do this. Look up First Peter if you want to. Read through it and just see what it says because you're going to see that it's going to deal with a lot of things that we've been dealing with, answers a lot of questions about what's happening today. The most important thing is this. Are you one of the chosen? Are you one of the ones that are called? Have you been obedient to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you haven't been, then it's all for naught, okay? Let me pray for us real quick. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it's you that walks us through times of distress, the times of trial, and that, Lord, there's a purpose behind it and that we can trust you and that we can rest in you. Lord, we love you and we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I meant to tell you, we are starting a local Bible study again right now, doing the book of Luke. And just go to my website right there, dalemore.tv, and all the information is right there. And Come out and join with us, okay? I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.